or where does the Ramayana end? So in this video, we'll be starting off with uh, motion through wind problems of relative velocity. So we have in this video relative velocity. motion through wind now in one of my previous videos which is the second video on river crossing problems I called these problems as aircraft problems I take my words back the reason behind taking my words back is the fact that I was thinking about this the other day and it occurred to me that there are so many examples of motion through wind in our lives that calling those problems just aircraft problems because of the fact that those are the kind of questions that are generally asked in the examinations is sheer injustice. I'll give you some examples of how moving through wind has an influence on our daily lives. Let's take an example. See, what's wind firstly? Wind is blowing air and when air blows obviously it flows in a particular direction so let's say the wind is blowing in this direction here and maybe you are walking in the same direction so you would have experienced this yourself that if you are walking in the direction of the wind you feel that you have to apply lesser force in your gait which makes your walking easier Whereas on the other hand, if you are walking against the direction of the wind, you have to exert more force to, or to be able to obtain the same speed. Therefore, we can say that wind has an influence on how fast or how slow a person walks. So that is one very important daily life example of motion through wind. Another example, uh, those of you who are in sports, they will be able to relate to this example much better. I, for myself, I play football very regularly. No? So, uh, what happened once is, I'm, I'm narrating a personal incident. I'm drawing a nice football pitch here. So, I was standing somewhere here and I had the ball on my feet. I tried to take a direct shot at the goal. I'm not really good at that. I took a shot and the ball kind of uh, moved to this direction. No? And I was pretty sure that it will, will not go into the goal. But I was pretty lucky. The wind favored me and the ball suddenly changes its direction and it moves into the goal. And the goalkeeper who was completely unsuspecting uh, that this would happen. He was fixated in his position and I myself was completely flabbergasted at how the ball just swung in because of the influence of the wind and went into the, into the goal. So... These are things that you will that actually do happen. That uh, you shoot the ball in one direction, but the wind causes the ball to move in another direction. This happens in cricket as well. The direction of the wind has a very important role in determining whether it will be easier to swing the ball inside, that is in swinging deliveries, or whether it will be easier to swing the ball outside, that is out swinging deliveries. So, I have now given a lot of examples of motion through wind. Yeah, another very important example. That is actually a complete means of transport. Uh, see, you must have seen this vehicle in books. This is a sailboat. What happens in a sailboat is that uh, you start, uh, you put your sailboat in water and wind hits this piece of cloth or plastic and this uh, the force exerted by the wind on this cloth causes the ship to move which again is an example of motion through wind so this is the reason these numerous examples of motion through wind is the reason I chose to change the name of aircraft problems to motion through wind so now things will be very similar to how we had uh, river crossing problems. The only uh, one very important difference obviously is going to be the fact that in river crossing problems the direction of velocity was taken with respect to the river bank and the flow of the water itself. 
if you recall the river crossing problems, they had two directions. Either the object moved upstream or it moved downstream. Upstream was when it moved against the flow of the water and downstream was when it moved with the flow of the water. However, this cannot be the case with wind because of the fact that it's really problematic to choose a reference point with reference to which we will take our angles and directions of the wind. For this reason, the directions in all problems pertaining, through, pertaining to motion through wind are taken with reference to Earth's magnetic north. So, the directions in motion through wind problems are measured with reference to the Earth's magnetic north. Now I'll just very briefly explain what do we mean by magnetic north. Basically this is part of uh, physics. But I'll just, because I've just used this terminology, I'll tell you. Uh, see, we know that Earth has a natural magnetic field. If you have physics, you'll know that very well. That Earth has a natural magnetic field. If we take a magnet and, it's, and we suspend it in air, the magnet is going to orientate itself along the magnetic field of the Earth. In, uh, in that case, the place where the suspended magnet's magnetic field points is called the Earth's magnetic north, which might not be same as the geographical north, but anyway, this is a very important reference point, nevertheless. Right, so you can say north only as well. So the directions are measured with reference to the Earth's north. So let's say the wind is blowing at an angle of 40 degrees to the Earth's north. So this is the north. This is east, this is south, this is west. So 40 degrees from north would be 40 degrees from here. And here comes my vector for the speed of the wind. And we know from O-level mathematics that all angles which are measured from north are known as bearings. Therefore, we can summarize this statement as the direction in motion through wind problems are given as bearings. Why? Because a bearing is an angle which is measured with reference to Earth's magnetic north or with reference to Earth's north. Fine. So we have concluded this that in motion through wind problems, the directions will be given as bearings that is with reference to north. In this case, that uh, uh, in such cases, when we have to give our directions as bearings, the easiest way to go about such questions is that we should make compasses. See, I made a compass here. No? We should make compasses at all important points in our vector diagrams. This is going to help us in manipulating the angles. When we will solve a question, we will understand this better. Now, Let's come to the components of relative velocity when we talk about motion through wind. So we'll take the example of a football field again. Let's say I'm standing here and I want to shoot my ball into the top right corner of the goal. I want to shoot my ball here. And in the current scenario, the wind is blowing in this direction. This is velocity of the wind. So now, if I want to shoot the ball into the top right corner of the goal and I decide to aim towards the top right corner of the goal, the problem is that my ball would end up somewhere here. Why? The reason is that it's not just the ball that's moving, it's also the wind. Therefore, this wind is going to have a pushing influence on my kick. And this is going to push the ball further to the right 
and the ball is not going to end up in the place where I want it to go. So to counter this problem, what I can do is that I can probably shoot somewhere here. Like I can take an aim towards the center of the hole probably and then allow the wind to push the ball in a way that it ends up in the top right corner as I had desired. So the final movement of the ball would be this way. So this is my starting position. This is my ending position. And this yellow vector tells me the actual distance my ball covers. Which means that the yellow vector would actually be representing the true velocity of the ball which can be written as Vb. The other important velocity that we have is this green vector which represents the velocity of wind. And then we have a third vector which is this blue vector. This blue vector is the relative velocity of the ball with respect to the wind. Now why is this the relative velocity? The answer is that this, this vector basically tells me the direction in which I should aim the ball so that I can end in my desired destination. Now how do I decide the direction in which I should take my aim? This decision is made, is made based on two things. Number one, where I want the ball to go. Where I want the ball to go. And number two, the direction of the wind. Now since the direction in which I'll aim is decided on the basis of two velocities, on the basis of two things, that is where I want the ball to go and the direction of the wind, this is referred to as the relative velocity because I have to take both the other things into account. So this tells me another important thing about motion through wind and that is the direction in which the object is steered is the relative velocity. And then obviously we have the other components that is uh, velocity of the wind and the true velocity. So the true velocity basically is in the direction of the line connecting the starting and ending points. Having identified the three vectors, we can now make our relative velocity equation very simply. That is velocity of the ball with respect to wind or in, other, or in other words, the relative velocity of the ball in wind is equal to velocity of the ball take away velocity of the wind. So this is my relative velocity equation. Now let's take this very example. I want the ball to end up in this position. So this becomes my true velocity. But I know that wind is blowing in this direction. So if I want to find out the angle at which I should aim my ball, I will have to use my relative velocity equation very simply. And what I will do is, let's see. I know that I want the ball to end up in this way. So this is my VB. And I know that this is the direction of wind. So I'll have to carry out vector subtraction. In my previous two videos, I've made this clear that in such cases, we'll have to alter our equation very slightly. So what we'll do is, this becomes Vb add negative Vw. And negative Vw would be the exact same vector, except that the arrow will be in the opposite direction. <coughs> so now I can use the tip to tail method again. I Add the vector velocity vector here. 
and now I connect both of them and here I get the relative velocity of the ball which tells me the direction in which I should aim my ball so that it can end up in the desired destination. Now you can alternatively be told the direction in which the ball is aimed and you might be told the velocity of the wind and you might be asked to find the true velocity of the ball. So in that case what we'll do is we'll manipulate our equation a bit. Let's say you are given the direction in which the ball is aimed that is the relative velocity and let's say you are given the velocity of the wind and you have to find the true velocity of the ball so I'll, I'll rearrange my equation such that I have the relative velocity at velocity of the wind is equal to V B. So again things become very simple. This is let's say my relative velocity. I add the velocity of wind here and here I get my true velocity of the ball. Right. So I hope things are clear now. Now we'll do one question. Uh, we'll do two questions in this video so that we can get the concept of uh, relative velocity uh, in wind crossing problems that is motion through wind and then uh, I'll try to make another video in which I'll solve three more questions on motion through wind so that you know how to exactly deal with questions on motion through wind. Right. The first question is a really simple question and you can expect not to see such a simple question in your paper. This is from June 2006, paper 1, question number 3. So the question is a plane flies due north from A to B a distance of 1000 kilometers. in a time of two hours. During this time, a steady wind of speed 150 kilometers per hour is blowing from Southeast. Find number one the speed of the plane in still air and number two the direction in which the plane must be steered. Right. So let's dissect this question now. The first thing that we have been given is the fact that the plane is uh, has to go from A to B and B is due north of A. So if this is A, B is right up ahead it at a distance of 1000 kilometers. So this distance is 1000 kilometers. And we know that the line connecting the starting and ending points tells us the true velocity, the direction of the true velocity. So this is going to be Vp, that is the true velocity of the object. Now is there any way I can find this true velocity? Yes, there is. See, we have been told that the distance AB is 1000 kilometers and this distance is covered in 2 hours. So dividing 1000 by 2 gives me the magnitude of VP and that is 500 kilometers per hour. Right. The second thing that we know is the fact that the wind is blowing at 150 kilometers per hour from southeast. This is really significant. What does blowing from southeast mean? Let's draw a compass here. Southeast is 
this direction and this angle would be 45 degrees this angle would be 45 degrees because southeast implies that the direction is exactly halfway between south and east okay. likewise northeast is going to mean the line which is exactly between north and east and so on now see we have been told here that uh, the direction of the wind is that it's blowing from southeast that means it's blowing towards northwest so this is actually the direction of velocity of wind. I hope this is clear. So now we have been asked to find the speed of the plane in still air. Speed of the plane in still air means relative velocity. And why does this mean relative velocity? I have explained this in the river crossing problems as well. The reason is that when we have to study the relationship between the velocities of two objects, we have to take one object as a reference point. The easiest reference point is always zero. So if I am taking one of the velocities as a reference point, I am assuming it to be kind of a new zero, right? For this reason, air, which is taken as a reference velocity, why? Because it is coming after the oblique sign in the relative velocity equation. This is taken as my reference, so it's my new zero. And therefore, the relative velocity is called the, uh, is referred to as speed of the object in still air, or if we talk about river crossing problems, speed of the object in still water. Right, so this is the relative velocity. Now I have to find the relative velocity, let's use the relative velocity equation. Velocity of the plane in wind is equal to velocity of the plane take away velocity of wind. That means we have to carry out vector subtraction. And in vector subtraction what we do is we alter our equation slightly. So I have to reverse the direction of velocity of wind. This is velocity of wind. If I reverse the direction, we again interestingly go back to south east. So this is negative velocity of wind. So what I'll now do is, I'll pick this vector of negative velocity of wind and add it here. This is negative Vw and the magnitude is 150 kilometers per hour. And what would be this angle? This angle would be 45 degrees. So we finally get this. And this is velocity of the plane in still air. Now I can find this very easily using the cosine rule. So V P slash W can be given by 500 squared, add 150 squared, take away 2 times 500 times 150 times cos of 45 degree. And the answer comes out to be minus 2 times 500 times 150 times cos of 45. The answer comes out to be 408 kilometers per hour corrects to three significant figures. So we have the answer to the first part. That is the speed of the plane in still air. The second thing is yet to be found. That is the direction in which the plane must be steered. So that is actually this direction. So I can find this angle using sine rule. Let's use the sine rule now. So this would be, let's call this angle theta. So Vw upon sine theta is equal to 45 degrees upon this. Now here I am, uh, alright sorry I have done a mistake here. This would be sine 45 the denominator. Now here I have to take the exact value of V P slash W and not the standard of value because this is going to give me an inaccurate answer. 
So I have this data stored in my calculator, the exact value stored in my calculator. So what I'll do is, I'll do the complete rearrangement first and then I'll use the saved information directly in my calculator and obtain the answer for theta. So anyway, this is going to become uh, VP slash W sine theta is equal to, this is 150, 150 sine of 45 degrees. So theta would be sine inverse of 150 times sine of 45 degrees upon Vp slash W. And this gives us sine inverse of 150 sine of 45 upon answer. And this is 15.1 degrees. Now remember, since I told you earlier as well that all directions are given as bearings and we know that bearings have, have to have three digits before the decimals. So the answer here would be 015.1 degrees. I hope this is clear. Now let's do another question. I'll clear this. This is also an easy question, not really difficult. But a plane whose speed in still air is 300 kilometers per hour. So we have been given the relative velocity here. Flies directly from x to y. So we know that the line that connects x and y would give us the direction of the true velocity of the plane. Given that y is 720 kilometers from x on a bearing of 150 degrees and that there is a constant wind of 120 kilometers per hour blowing towards the west. In the last question, we had blowing from southeast. Here we have blowing towards the west. So we have been very straight away given the direction in which the wind is blowing. So you have to pay attention to uh, the wordings of the question whether it says towards or whether it says uh, from. Anyway, going towards the west, find the time taken for the flight. For the flight. So first let's draw a diagram to visualize this situation. The first thing that we can draw very easily is the fact that this is the direction of the wind and that is 120 kilometers per hour towards the west. Right? This is simple. The second thing. This is let's say x and now where is y? y is at a bearing of 150 degrees from x. So in order to deal with bearings, what we'll always do is, we will draw compasses at all important points. So here is my compass. Bearing is an angle taken with reference to the north. So I'll take my bearing now. 90 degrees, since the bearing is 150 degrees, a further 60 degrees we have to go down. And this is 150 degrees now. And now I can draw an arrow that goes somewhere like this. Here. 
and let's say this is y and this distance is 720 kilometers and the line connecting x and y would give me the direction of the true velocity of the plane right the other thing that we know is the magnitude of the relative velocity we don't know the direction of the relative velocity that is we don't know the direction in which the plane is being steered in that case when we don't know the direction of a particular vector and uh, for another vector we don't know the magnitude see we have three vectors huh? the first vector is the relative velocity for the relative velocity we know the magnitude but we don't know the direction the other vector is velocity of the wind for this vector we know the magnitude and we also know the direction and the last vector that we have is the true velocity of the wind of the plane sorry for this we don't know the magnitude but we do know the direction so there is this vector for which we have incomplete information and this vector for which we have incomplete information if we have two vectors for which we have incomplete information then in order to draw the vector diagram we will use the vector whose direction is known to us so in order to draw my vector diagram i will use vp and not the relative velocity so to make the vector diagram once again what we'll do is we'll use the relative velocity equation so this is v p slash w is equal to v p take away v w and since we have to consider this vector and this vector that is we have to do vector subtraction so i'll manipulate a bit and negative v w would be exactly the same thing as v w except that the direction will be reversed so this is negative v w the magnitude remains the same at 120 kilometers per hour so now let's draw our sketch this is vp with an unknown magnitude and now i can add negative vw here and it has a magnitude of 120 kilometers per hour so this vector that i will just be drawing would represent the relative velocity which has a magnitude of 300 kilometers per hour now in order to find vp which is essential if we have to find the time taken for the flight we somehow need some more angles so in order to find the angles let's draw the compasses at all important points so i draw the compasses again at this point I can draw a compass I can draw a compass here and I can draw a compass here as well right so the angles that are known to me are number one I know this angle and this is 150 degrees now since this whole thing is 150 degrees and this part is 90 degrees the remaining part of this angle which is this is 60 degrees right now see this is a horizontal axis this is also a horizontal axis and it's very uh, very easy to understand that all horizontal axes on the compasses are going to be parallel to each other Likewise, all vertical axes are also going to be parallel to each other. This means that the property, the angle properties of parallel lines can be used very easily in these cases. So if you see, this is one vector, this is one parallel line, this is another parallel line, and this VP vector is actually acting as a transversal between these two parallel lines, and therefore, this 60 degree angle 
and this angle are internal angles and and we know that internal angles are supplementary therefore this angle is going to be 120 degrees having found this angle out we can now use the cosine rule to find vp and how will how will we do that let's say that vp is equal to y so let's apply the cosine rule now according to the cosine rule this 300 kilometers here is equal to the square root of y squared add 120 squared take away 2 times y times 120 cos of 120 kilometers per hour sorry cos of 120 degrees right so I guess it will be better not to place the square root at this point of time And let's replace this with a square here. So we have 300 squared. Let's send this 120 square on the other side. Take away 120 squared is equal to y squared minus 240y. Let's find cos of 120. Cos of 120 is equal to negative half. So this whole thing becomes plus 120y. So I get a quadratic equation that is y squared plus 120y. I can send this stuff after subtraction to this side. And this is 300 squared minus 120 squared which is 75600 is equal to 0. So now let's solve this quadratic equation to get y. y is equal to negative plus minus square root of b square minus 4a c upon 2a. I'll just enter all this information in my calculator. Minus 4 times 1 times negative 75600 upon 2. So one value of y is 221.4249. The other value of y is a negative value of negative 341.4. We'll reject this value. And this is the velocity of the, the true velocity of the plane, Vp. Now, in order to take the to, uh, in order to find the time taken for this journey, we will divide this distance which was 720 kilometers by this velocity. So time taken is equal to 720 upon 221.4249. We'll prefer to write the exact value here. So the answer comes out to be 3 hours 3.25 hours. Mostly you are asked to write your answer in hours and minutes to the nearest minute. So this is 3 hours and 0.25 hours is 15 minutes. So this is going to be my answer. I hope the concepts behind the, the motion through wind problems are clear. I'll do another video in which I'll solve a few more questions on uh, motion through wind which will hopefully clarify things a bit more and then we'll move to uh, the interception problems of relative velocity. Till then, assalamu